Hi, um, okay, today I would like to discuss uh, a number of items that have to do with how we can crowdsource some important tasks in systems biology and in particular I would like to focus on uh, aspects of crowdsourcing of the problem of network inference. In a way what we are trying to do is to seek the wisdom of crowds uh, through challenge-based competitions in biomedical research. What I'm going to be discussing today with you is uh, some of the uh, concept of crowdsourcing, what do we mean by crowdsourcing, and, uh, and then some of the benefits of crowdsourcing. There are some benefits that are obvious and some benefits that are not so obvious that I would like to highlight. Um, after that, I would like to discuss one project in which I have been involved for many years called the Dialogue for Reverse Engineering Assessment and Methods, what we call DREAM. Give a few examples uh, of DREAM, in particular on network inference, as the subject of this class is uh, biological networks. Eventually, I would like to discuss with you how to participate in the, in the DREAM challenges, giving you a few examples of recently held challenges in the context of what we call the DREAM 8, that means the 8th edition of the DREAM project. Let's start by crowdsourcing and highlight that crowdsourcing is not new. There has been a number of very interesting examples in which um, an organization such as, for example, the, the British Crown puts to the community a problem. And the problem that the, the case of the longitude price dealt with is how to find where you are from east to west when you are at sea. And so the, the British Crown needed desperately to have a reliable way of understanding where what the latitude of a vessel at sea was. And the reason why this particular challenge was very interesting is because it um, elicited the interest of many people, not, not, not only because it was an important problem, but also because there was a lot of money involved. In today's value, probably the amount of the prize, the award, was about $5 million. So uh, the, the concept then was sufficiently interesting that uh, many people tried to solve it. And amongst the people who tried to solve this problem, the history books say that Isaac Newton, the famous physicist, probably one of the smartest people ever that ever lived, tried to solve the problem, but he wasn't the, the guy who really finally solved it. The, 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 the person who solved it was a person by the name of John Harrison who had the right expertise and the right background and the right obsession and the right interest to be able to tackle the problem and come with a satisfactory solution. Not that Newton is not was not smart enough, it's only that the people that are the chosen ones to solve problems are the ones who have the right expertise and have thought about a particular side of, of, uh, of, of the problem for long enough. And so that is something that we have seen during the examples of crowdsourcing with the DREAM project, is that sometimes people that you are not very well uh, familiarized with, uh, people from different parts of the globe, are the ones who solve a tough problem and not necessarily those that are the most famous in the field. Today we, all, we see crowdsourcing all the time, we hear it in the radio and, uh, and we use it every day, for example when we get to use Wikipedia, which in principle is an effort that takes the, um, the goodwill of everybody who's interested in contributing. Of course, many of the articles are written by just a few people, but the reality of it is that everybody has the chance to contribute to it, and that's one example of crowdsourcing. There are other examples, such as Innocentive or Kaggle, or uh, which are two commercial platforms for crowdsourcing scientific problems, as well as the XPRIZE. Some of you may be familiar with the XPRIZE. In the area of systems biology and computational biology, there has been a number of very interesting efforts over the course of the last uh, two decades. Starting probably with one of the most famous efforts to try to make sure that we understand how well we do when we say that we are solving the problem of protein structure prediction. I'm referring to the effort called CASP or Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction. Effort started in 1994 and really triggered a number of other uh, similar ideas in, in different fields. I invite you to go to the website of CASP because it's a paradigmatic example of using crowdsourcing in order to solve a problem with high levels of rigor. Over the course of the subsequent decades, many efforts 
came to light in order to solve different uh, problems in computational biology. And the one that I am particularly fond of, uh, having been the founder, is DREAM. This concept of trying to verify whether our algorithms are actually giving the correct answers when it comes to network inference. The D is for dialogue, which means we want to talk about this. We need to do a collaborative effort because the problem is too hard for anybody to solve in isolation. And the RE of DREAM is reverse engineering, is the concept of trying to find the causal mechanisms underlying biological systems. The A is for assessment. We are trying to make sure that we understand how well or how badly are we uh, solving a problem. So DREAM, Dialogue for Reverse Engineering Assessment of Methods, is uh, an effort to try to lend rigor, uh, at the same time foster collaboration in uh, areas of network inference and uh, algorithms for network inferences. There are a number of other interesting uh, projects that uh, have come to light and that are continuing to, to proliferate. All of them play a role because we believe that this new way of doing science, which is crowdsourcing and, and collaborative competitions, uh, have a place in order to move uh, our field forward. Of note is also this concept uh, of improver, which is another uh, effort in which uh, I have been involved. Improver is a, a similar concept as, as, as Dream and as the other in which the emphasis is in trying to do a quality control of processes in industrial research. Improver then stands for industrial methodology for process verification in research. Now what are the benefits of crowdsourcing? As I said before, the A of DREAM is, is assessment or performance evaluation. So we would like to really create a framework in which our predictions are robust, unbiased, consistent, and rigorous. Now, why is this important? It has come to, um, you know, recognized as, as a serious problem in, in today's science methodology, the fact that we need to emphasize science validation much more than we thought before. And a few examples that appear in the literature are listed here in, the, in this slide. There is a pharmaceutical company, Amgen, recently, a couple of years ago, some scientists from Amgen tried to uh, reproduce 50 landmark papers in preclinical oncology. And very sadly, only six out of those 53, that is 11% uh, of them, were uh, reproduced. That means the scientists at Amgen were able to reproduce only 11% of those results that were taken for true as correct results in the scientific literature. This is alarming and uh, if it were an isolated case it would be less of a problem but actually it was not the only case in which this happened. Another company, Bayer Healthcare, reported a little earlier than only 25% uh, of the published preclinical studies that they tried to reproduce could be reproduced. That means uh, from the last two uh, examples that between 75 and 90 percent of the existing literature that, that, that were published recently in very high profile journals, uh, only between 75 percent and 90 percent was able to be reproduced. That's considerably uh, higher than anybody would have guessed a few years ago. So the ability for a crowdsourced effort to verify computational methods is, is very clear and is as follows. Uh, if I ask you guys to submit the result of your predictions and you don't know what the result of your predictions are, it's very likely that if I know how to evaluate those predictions, then I will know whether your method is reasonably good and how good or how bad it is. So the notion of a crowdsourced effort in which the gold standard is known that can be used to uh, make uh, an evaluation is very valuable in the light of these problems with respect to reproducibility and, and verification of scientific results. It is also interesting that we can, if we make a big uh, fuss about a particular scientific problem and a lot of people participate in it, that we might be able to discover probably the best method today that can solve the problem at hand. What kind of problems are, am I talking about? I'm talking about you know, the problem of network inference or the problem of prediction of survival for cancer patients given genomics data. 
and these kinds of problems. There is also an important thing with respect to this performance evaluation, which is that we can also get the first glimpse at whether a, pro a problem is solvable. Because I can always say, okay, give me your DNA, say, the, the, the sequence of your DNA, and I will tell you, you know, whether you are going to win the lottery. But obviously, I can say that, but is that possible? Well, is that possible when we say, I can predict the cytotoxicity of a drug given the SNPs, that means the mutations in the DNA of a person. Can I do that? Well, we don't know whether we can do that. But if we invite a hundred groups to try and nobody is able to do that, then it's very likely that the problem is unsolvable with the data at hand. So determining the solvability of a scientific question is one of the things that we can start to um, um, uh, discuss when we do a crowdsourcing effort. Let me go through a few of the benefits of crowdsourcing a little faster. We can definitely sample the space of methods. That means if many people are submitting their, their predictions, there will be many, many methods and we will start to see what methods are being considered by the community to solve a particular problem. And we can accelerate the research in the sense that if I say a hundred groups are trying to solve a particular problem, at the end of five months, all those groups submit their code and submit their uh, methods, then suddenly, for that particular problem, we have a multiplication of 100 with respect to what any one group can do. And I think that is not to be overlooked when you think that the slower we do our science in biomedicine, the more is the suffering of patients that could be, could be helped by these kinds of, of computational analysis of, of their genomic data. Finally, I want to say something that I particularly consider to be very important, and we will see in a second why. I mean the fact that by doing this crowdsourcing, we are putting together people to think that, that uh, together. So, it, so basically, we are fostering the building of a community around the solution of some problems. And this is very important because, as we know, two minds think better than one. And I can think by myself, and even if I am very, very smart, eventually I will fall trap of my own prejudice, and nobody is there to tell me what I am saying or thinking wrong. So creating a community in which everybody brings their expertise is essential. If you speak Spanish, please take a look at my TEDx talk on collaborative science. In, in this link where I discuss some examples of why collaborative and uh, science and community building is important. But I'm not the first to say that the, the concept of the wisdom of the crowds has been there for more than a century and it has been discussed already by Professor Mai and in previous classes. Let me discuss one more time the wisdom of the crowds because you know, it's a concept that I really love. It's so so intuitive if you think of it, but however, we use it very sparsely, and I think we could use it much more in, in science and, and uh, in research. The wisdom of the crowd started as a concept or, or, or as a scientific discipline, if you will, when a, a famous statistician called uh, Francis Galton, who actually was a cousin of Darwin, Charles Darwin, was trying to do some sociolo sociological experiment that is uh, beyond the scope of, of my class, but it's interesting to study the, the reasons why he did that. But anyway, he decided to take the cards where about 800 people had written the, uh, their predictions about the weight of an ox. So all these people were farmers in a, a county fair in, uh, in the UK, and for all these people, probably, predicting the weight of an ox was not just a pastime. It was actually something that has to do with, you know, their living, their livelihood. You know, they need to estimate reasonably fast and accurately the weight of an ox. So it's not that these people were just eyeballing without any pre previous knowledge. For them, these kinds of uh, activities were part of their lives as farmers. Anyway, now, uh, Francis Galton decided to, um, to see the extent to which any of these people could guess correctly. And his prejudice was that probably nobody, or none of them will predict very accurately. Because he, was one of, he is one of the founders of statistics, one of the very natural things to do is to create a, a, a cumulative distribution and to, uh, and to compute the mean. And he computed the mean, 
and found that the mean of all the predictions was 1,197 pounds. Now, what a surprise was that that number was only one pound away from the actual weight of this ox that was actually 1,198 and the mean was closer to the actual weight than the closest of the predictions so in a way the crowds if you put together their, their, uh, their best guesses have an aggregate intelligence if, if, if you allow me to use the word intelligence in a figurative way have an added wisdom that has to do with the fact that the extreme biases compensate each, each other and, and what remains as the correct guess will persist, end up uh, dominating the final prediction. So DREAM is an effort that takes into account the fact that if we are many people thinking about the same problem, it is very likely that we will be able to solve the problem better. Let me tell you then a little bit more what is DREAM, the Dialogue for Reverse Engineering Assessment and Methods. DREAM is a crowdsourcing effort that poses questions that we call challenges about systems biology modeling and data analysis. And what kind of problems are we thinking of? Well, typically we are thinking about transcriptional networks, about signaling networks, about what happens when you perturb a system, a biological system, what is the, your best prediction of what the response to that perturbation will be. We are also interested in translational research, that means how can we use genomics in order to help patients and doctors treat their patients. How do we uh, create a challenge? A challenge that means how do we morph a scientific question into a challenge? So basically the idea is that we start by having a good understanding of the outcome that we want to make people predict, the ground truth. So having the ground truth allows us to be able to eventually evaluate the predictions. But we don't give the ground truth to uh, the participants. We only give data that has been collected from the system for which we know the ground truth. So for example, suppose that we have, we know for some reason the transcription network of a particular or organism. So we will give gene expression data, we can give uh, chip seq data, we can give uh, proteomics data and so on, uh, but we will not give the actual network of interactions, just the data. Now that data is then crowdsourced and democratized, if, if you will, to everybody who wants to use that data, even if that data is sometimes unpublished, so everybody has the opportunity to use that data and people can make their predictions. Their predictions will be in the form of some pre-formatted uh, network that we will then be able to compare with the ground truth for that biological system. Then we can say who is really predicting correctly and who is really not predicting so correctly what the actual network underlying that biological system is. At the same time, as we said before, we are accelerating the the uh, elucidation of, that, of, of, of the network, the transcription network, for example, for that particular biological system, because suddenly we have like, you know, uh, uh, tens and tens of, of potential methods to solve, to solve that. And we are making everybody analyze the same data, therefore there is a potential collaboration that can uh, result from, from these people talking about how they solve that same problem uh, at the same time. So, and finally, we have a way to uh, do uh, an unbiased evaluation. Now, typically, and I think you have this started to discuss with Professor Mahayan what is the, 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 the nuts and bolts of doing network inference. You typically have a target organism or a target cell type or a target um, biological system, typically an intracellular biological system. And you get data such as gene expression, chip seq, proteomics, flow cytometry, and you do perturbations to your system that are picked up by this data that you have collected. At the end, uh, the data of the perturbations and the different data modalities are harnessed in some uh, methodological framework, framework that could be, if you are interested, for example, if you are a statistician, probably you do regression or mutual information or correlation or all kinds of Bayesian uh, inference and you have your final result which is your reconstructive, ne reconstructive network. So we did these kinds of a challenge during the last four or five years 
and I will discuss here for example three of those right now in Dream 8 we finished one challenge on signaling network that I will discuss a little bit later so Dream followed by a, a number means the addition of the challenges that we are talking about so we did a network inference challenge in 2000 eight in the dream three in 2009 and 2010 in total we had of the order of a hundred teams predicting of the order of 1000 networks and we learned quite a few things about network uh, inference let me discuss the dream five effort uh, on network inference those consisted of predicting basically four different types of network one was created in silico that means it was a mathematical network that we created as if it were a real network but also there was the E. coli network, the yeast or Sa Saccharomyces cerevisiae network, and also the uh, Staphylococcus aureus gene regulatory network. And uh, in this slide you see what conditions and how many uh, microarrays were used in order to infer that network from, uh, from data. Let me discuss uh, the results of this, of a paper that appeared in this issue of Nature Methods in August 2012 and I think it's an interesting paper to read if um, if you're interested in this in this subject the title of the paper is wisdom of crowds for robust gene network inference one of the important um, conclusions that we obtain is that different methods are best performers for different networks that means there is not one uh, size fits all when it comes to network inference and actually that's pretty much a conclusion that we have um, reached in many challenges that we have run that there is no one algorithm that solves all the similar problems you know there is no best there are very good ones but sometimes the one that is best today is not necessarily best in a similar data set tomorrow and let me show this with this particular example of network inference in, in the dream Five challenge so here we have our in silico results each bar correspond to a different method of solution for example there are eight regression based methods five mutual information based methods uh, three correlation based methods and so on so the height of the bar here is the uh, performance of a team the higher the better uh, the perfect performance would be 100 and what we are measuring is what we call the area under the precision recall so the y-axis is the area under the precision recall in percentage values even if you don't know exactly what that is imagine that the higher that number the better the prediction it is now we see here that for the in silico network there was one of the regression methods that was the best for the E. coli one it was another method based on some ANOVA statistics uh, thinking that was the very best and for the East one there was random forest type of network that did the best uh, the best job so you see even though all of these methods try to solve all of these problems the method that solved the one problem for example in the silico was not the same as the one that was the best performer in the E. coli and so on so this is very important that means that we have to have a toolkit of very many different uh, methods in order to pick and choose which one to use but how do we know which one to use well it is interest interesting to show that if you make an aggregate over all the methods not just relying on one but just put together all the methods and how do you do that it can vary but imagine that there is a way in which you can combine the ways in which you um, uh, you know the, the goodness of each of the results into one meta prediction that incorporates all the predictions of all the methods if you do that for example the aggregate is better than the best possible performer in the E. coli if you use this is the overall performance over the three uh, networks the uh, uh, what we call the community based uh, prediction the aggregate prediction is also the best overall is however it is however not the best for the E. coli is the third best that's why we say that the this wisdom of crowds is robust even if you use a lot of networks in this case uh, 29 networks and you are you are aggregating some networks that are not so good even so the community one is close to the best is the third best 
And the same is true for, eco for yeast, for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, for which the community based is the fourth, but overall it has been the best. If you aggregate, the consistency of the community network is always at the top. Remember that we are be going to be talking about the overall score, now the score over all the networks that were inferred. And in this um, slide, we are seeing in the left uh, chart the following. So if I take single methods, the range of their overall score goes between 0 to 40. This overall score is actually not exactly the area under the precision recall that I was saying before. It, it's based on a statistical measure of uh, aggregates of p-values, uh, but let's not concentrate on that. Let's again say that the higher the value of the overall score, the better the result. If you aggregate five networks taken at random, from about uh, amongst the 29 that were submitted to the challenge. We have that the median is much better than the median of the individuals. And the outlier is much better than the best of uh, all the individual submissions. Now keep adding and add 10, aggregate 10 methods. You will have of the order of, you know, an overall score that is about 50% better than it was before. And if you keep adding methods, you know, 15 taken at random, the possible range of values of the overall score keep growing until uh, when you have all the 29 methods, you are pretty much, much, much better than the best possible overall score of the individual submissions. That means that even when we aggregate uh, methods uh, whose performance is not so good, the overall score continues to increase as we increase and we add more and more uh, methods in our uh, aggregate. That is why we call that this application of wisdom of the crowds for the problem of network inference is robust. That even if you add not so good methods, your overall performance will not be great. The right most, the right um, uh, chart here shows something slightly different. This shows how often my method, uh, when I aggregate, say, 10 different methods, how often, how often the aggregate is better than the best, or second best, or third best. And let me explain this very briefly. Suppose that they have, let's take this 15, the aggregate of 15 networks, the 15 predictions. So what we have here is that about seven in 70% of the cases, in the great majority of the cases, the aggregate is better than the best. It's better than the best of the 15th prediction. And when it's not better than the best, in about 90% of the cases, is second best. <clears throat> if you aggregated 20 predictions, then in 80% of the cases, the aggregate is going to be better than the best. And in 99% of the cases, it's going to be either the very best, better than best, or second to the best. So in a way, again, aggregating only makes sense. And why? Is because we are, in truth, using the wisdom of the crowds. The different ways of thinking how to, uh, to infer networks is being really aggregating in one final prediction as Galton was trying to aggregate the weight uh, guesses uh, of all the 800 participants in that county fair. Uh, just to summarize that paper, then um, we created a community network of uh, Staphylococcus aureus, and this community network is the first time in which a network of Staph aureus was actually proposed, and is our way of saying this is our prediction that makes this a scientific claim. A claim is scientific when it can be refuted, and this network can be refuted in the sense that if you measure each of the edges in, and if you measure enough of them, then you will be able to say, ah, the wisdom of the cross does work because most of the edges are correct or not. But anyway, that is something that, we, that uh, remains yet to be seen. I want to finalize with a um, couple, a little demo, not really a full-fledged demo, but uh, you know, a demonstration of uh, the website where you can go in order to get the data. Uh, if you want to uh, use the data that was used in the recent challenges, for example, or if you want to participate in the future challenges. 
So um, I want to say that the Sage Bio Networks group and our group, the Dream Group, joined forces uh, in doing challenges. You know, this was particularly interesting. In, in, in February this year, 2013, Sage Bio Networks and, and Dream uh, joined forces to foster collaborative and open science uh, through the curation of systems biology challenges. And we are doing that because uh, SAGE has been uh, uh, developing a platform that is ideal for this task, which is called Synapse. And I want to show right now how to go to uh, the website and, and where to find the challenges if you are interested in using uh, that data for your own research. So you can go to www.synapse.org and here is the Synapse website and where you have you have here the dream eight challenges and you can uh, cycle through a few of the challenges we did uh, this year the HPN dream breast cancer network inference challenge and I would like to discuss something about it in a second a challenge on predicting the tox toxicity of different compounds and a challenge on uh, uh, estimating the parameters of a whole cell model that, that was also very interesting and an important problem in systems biology. So let's go back to the HPN DREAM Breast Cancer Network Inference Challenge. By the way, HPN stands for Heritage Provider Network and was the company that uh, funded much of our research and awards uh, monetary awards for the best performers and we are very thankful to them so let me change uh, click here on challenge details and registration and this will uh, lead us to the website where the description of the challenge is so if we go down we will find that let me go down we, we have uh, what I just went through is a number of updates but uh, when the challenge was uh, launched, there was a synopsis, a background, a motivation, where the data ha can be found, and the explanation of the different challenges. Yes, there were several sub-challenges, but let me go to the sub-challenge number one, which was on network inference. The idea was to uh, use breast cancer proteomic data to uh, infer the network under uh, the network that gets activated under eight different stimuli uh, that is when you hit the the cells the cancer cell lines using uh, different stimuli and there were four different cancer cell lines so let's go to that link and here we will find a, you know the type of data there were ca four cancer cell lines breast cancer cell lines MCF7 UACCA12, BT20, BT549. For each of them, there were eight stimuli. There were four different treatments, that means inhibitors that hit uh, basically four different drugs that hit different uh, uh, phosphoproteins uh, by inhibiting them. And then uh, you had a time course, temporal behavior after you uh, treated the cells. And the idea is to use all this data in order to infer the, the connections between one phosphoprotein and the next, or a kinase and its substrate. Let me go back up. If you want to find the data for it, you can go uh, back to the previous page and you will see the files. And you go to those files and you can choose which data you want to do download. Once you go there, it will um, explain to you what what the data is, and if you can, if you finally click on the data, you can see the data ready to be downloaded. In order to download it, you have to register to Synapse, and you have to um, uh, agree to some terms and conditions. I want to finalize by showing that as the as we went doing the challenge there were some data that, that we were using in order to make uh, to score and create a leaderboard that contains the best performing teams as as the, uh, the challenge uh, went going and if you were interested in looking at the code of that best performing team in principle you could go as well and and get the code because that's the basis of uh, collaboration and transparency is that one could rerun and reproduce code. To finalize, I would like to acknowledge um, all the people who are going to help uh, us organize DREAM. I am 
almost afraid of showing this list because probably it's incomplete. There are many more people that I should have acknowledged, but these are the ones that uh, have considerably helped in the recent challenges. And I will leave this here to you more than to read on each of the names is to show that, there, that that dream is really a team effort and that, um, you know, and the final user is really the community and everybody is invited to either participate in DREAM or help us organize these challenges that I think could really make a difference. Thank you very much.